Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the last study for this week. As we return to this portion of Daniel 11, as we consider carefully this, which we started speaking about yesterday, shall we continue to ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance and his blessing? For we need his wisdom. We need his direction. We need him to show us that which we should do and what we should understand for this time in earth's history. Shall we now seek him as we come before his throne of grace? Shall we seek him in prayer? Will you join me? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you, Father, for all that you are doing in our lives. Help us now as we open your word to consider this, these points that we should understand. I ask a blessing upon each that are here. I ask, Father, for your guidance, that you direct us now so that your will may be done. Open our minds, open our hearts, so that as we come before you, as we are opening your word, we may more clearly understand so that we may be directly prepared for all that you would have done in this world. Forgive us of our sins. Direct us now in the path that we need to walk. For this, Father, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, the verse that we're returning to. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge, to make white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. So we have these three steps. Falling. Purging, making white. Right. Is this and and, and we did see in Daniel 12, verse 10 as well, but in a different order. Right. And and we align them with um, the message to the Laodiceans. Okay. And three angels' messages and to Millerite history. So do we remember the question that we were at, asking at the end of the study yesterday? Refresh my, re refresh my mind, please. Well, well, the question that we had, there was a, a couple of questions. So one is, why are they in the order they're in, uh, in this verse and in, in verse 10? In verse 10, they appear to be in the correct order, the way that we would understand them as the order of the three angels' messages. Um, and then in Revelation, message to the Laodiceans, they're in a reverse order. Right, gold tried in the fire is first rather than trying the last, trying being judgment or testing, right? The third step. Okay. White raiment's the second one. And and ISAF, which would be the spiritual enlightenment that happens with the arrival of the first message. So that one's in a reverse order. And then uh, we were addressing the other question related to that was if we take that this time of the end refers to 1798 and the time appointed to October 22nd, 1844. And so that's the interpretation we had of this verse. Then um, we see this as Millerite history. And then the question is, the idea is regarding the message to the Laodiceans, that it's the understanding of Millerite history that is the message to the Laodiceans. Right. So, so, so the guess the question of how do we make sense out of the order? And, and this is identical with 12 verse 10 in, even though it says purified, made white and tried, it's the same Hebrew words, just in a different order. Okay. So are we looking that tried and falling are, are the equivalents? Well, no, it says some of them of, of understanding shall fall. And that is to try them, to purge them, and to make them white. So the falling okay. is not one of the steps. It's just that. And, and so the ones of understanding, we would take that as the wise. So that they're going to have a fall of sorts. Now, would, I think that that refers to the disappointment. Okay, then we're on the same page. Yeah. Okay. So some of them of understanding shall go through a disappointment. Try them. Right. That's the fall. And that's that's to try them. So that, that was the third step. All right. 
And it says, and then it says to purge and to make them white, which is the first and second step. Right. I believe the point that you had made with this question yesterday was, is this not a, a direct mirror for what we have been seeing in Revelation? Well, well, Revelation would be a mirror in, in, in that it's the reverse of the three steps. It's going to go three, two, one. Okay. Where chapter 12, verse 10 goes one, two, three in the proper order. This one goes three, one, two. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the question is, is, is why particularly? Well, you know, one is why does this one do it this order? 12, verse 10 does it the correct order. But Revelation uh, 3, what was it, verse 14? 12, 10. No, but Revelation. Um, uh, three message to latest scenes. I think it's three fourteen. That goes, you know, um, go Third, try to move. Yeah. So that one does it in reverse order. Three, two, one. Now we can see that that is a mirror to Millerite history to the order. Is, is there something else about these this order that we need to take into account? Well. Is this verse presenting something literal or is it presenting something spiritual? Well, it's presenting something spiritual. Uh, you know, cause even if you look at the word try, uh, 6884, saraf, it means to fuse, that is refine, you know, so it refers to, uh, gold, right? The refining of gold. It, it's also, can be translated as goldsmith, right? Depending on the context and the form, to melt pure. It can also mean purge away or try, right? So this is a refining process. All right. Okay, so that's going to be mentioned first, and then, and then you have the next one, uh, uh, barar, that is to clarify or to brighten. That's to make bright. That's 1305. And um, and then now it's um, and then you're going to have to make white. Uh, that's going to be uh, Laban. Laban. Right. Uh, to be or become white. So now some people reading this who don't understand the three angels messages you know, might just see these as all sort of synonymous, the trying, the purging, to make them white is also like just all together is just a thing. But we see them as three steps. Right. Okay. Yeah. Now, the, the next word there, even two, right, in, in Hebrew, that's the word ad, 5704. And and, and the way it's translated, like even unto the time of the end, is the kind of the way that it's going to happen. All this is going to happen up, up to the time of, of the end, right? That's the way you would kind of read it if you just didn't think carefully, right? So that you would think, well, this is all about the period of the 1260 up to the time of the end, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Right. Now, but that's not really supported. And the time of the end is that one uh, at Kate's, right? So it's the common thing we have here for time of the end. Uh, the word time at Kate's end, extremity. But the word odd that precedes it, it can mean lots of different things. It can be used as a preposition, an adverb, a conjunction. But it, it can mean, you know, up to or the space of, or during, right? And then um, and then we got the time of the end. And then you're going to have this word key, which is translated as because, right? Uh, it is yet for a time appointed. So the word yet, ode, we've run into that one before, which, which can mean uh, an iteration or a continuance, right? Okay. Um, and and then of course uh, the moed is the the time appointed. Uh, so the way that I read it is that you can translate this from the time of the end until the time appointed. So they're going to be uh, tried, purged, and made white 
from the time of the end to the time appointed. So from 1798 to 1844, it can be understood in that way. And that's not stretching the Hebrew in any sense. It's just that the Hebrew is is different than English. So in order to interpret it, you have to start with, you know, an assumption, right? So they start with an assumption. Oh, it's just going to be, be referring up to the time of the end. But that's just an assumption. It's not really in the Hebrew itself, especially when you have that word yet or owed in there. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, as, as a question, the margin reading in the 1769 Bible would, instead of saying try them, would say buy them. Buy them? Buy them. That might be a typo. Okay. Yeah, because there's nothing about buy. This this is 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 definitely try. Okay. Yeah. Is that B Y or B U Y? Uh it's B Y. Bravo Yankee. Yeah, that's just a typo. I'm just wondering if if some other manuscript they were using might have had that. No, because there is no other manuscript. There really is only two Hebrew manuscripts for the Old Testament. And 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 they only differ in like a few places, unlike the Greek uh, New Testament, which has lots of different things. But yeah, so it's nothing about. Yeah, and that wouldn't even make sense to buy them. Yeah, it's just it's just a typo sometimes that was happen with uh, translating the text. Okay, so. So why why this order? What's the meaning of, of try try them and to purge? Right. What's the different What's the difference between try and purge in um, that order? And white make white. Okay. So so the word try is where is this here? Okay. Yeah. So the word try. Uh, Saraf means to fuse that is refined, literally or figuratively, right? Now, it can also be translated as purge, right? Because there is a relationship between a trying and purging, right? Uh, the purging is, is, means to uh, clarify, that is make bright, okay? And then the Laban, is uh, to become white, right? So now if we think about these, these steps, these, these purging, making white, to try, trying is sort of the test, right? So that's how we understand trying. There's gold tried in the fire. Um, we have it in Malachi, um, this process of refining. What was purge again? Purge, it, it, it means to make bright. To test, make bright, and then make white. Yeah. So they're all, all related. They're all, all dealing with a purification process. <laughs> and in, in chapter 12, verse 10, it says purified, made white, and tried. Purified is the same Hebrew word as purge. Make white's the same Hebrew word, and try is the same Hebrew word, right? So they're just in... 12 verse 2, it's just going to be in a different order. 12 verse 10, I mean. Right? But many shall be purified. That's 1305. Made white, 3835 Laban. And tried, 6884 Saraf. Um, and then it's going to talk about the wicked that shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand. But the wise shall understand. So you have understanding here as well so some of them of understanding that's the whys and then you have this th these three steps which we equate to the three angels messages and here from the time of the end until 1844 so from 1798 till 1844 i found something interesting when i first became a christian the first book i read was the book of proverbs and counseled mm -hmm. to above everything get wisdom so i prayed for wisdom and then i got knowledge but there's a third 
step, and that's to, to your wisdom and understand to your wisdom and knowledge add understanding. Yeah. So it's like the understanding seems to be the third step in purification, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. So and and they're all sort of connected too, right? Just as this purification, they're they're all basically dealing with some kind of knowledge. And and some people will translate them differently depending on the context. Now, you know, in Psalm 100 or, or 12 verse 6, which is a symbol of 1260, right? It says, the words of the Lord are pure words, uh, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. So here we can see that this purification is connected to a symbol of seven times. And, and that one's the adverb of seven. That's uh, Shabbatayim. It's, it's the dual adverb of 7651, which is the one from Leviticus 26. So this is 7659. But can we kind of see that these are all related to a prophetic message dealing with the 1260 and, and the end of the 1260? And we have now seven times. Now, we know we have a three-step testing prophetic message. But in that, we, we have seven way marks, right? The arrival, formalization, and empowerment of the first. The arrival, for, formalization, empowerment of the second message. And then the arrival of the third. Are we just, are we just seeing something we want to see, or does this make sense? Well, I think it's something that we need to fix firmly in our minds. Well, yeah. I mean, we we need to understand these these things. It's obviously important points, and yeah, it's Revelation three and just verse eighteen. My counsel of thee to buy buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. Right. So here we're going to have this really expanded on uh, gold tried in the fire. So obviously that's trying, right? White raiment, so the white here is related to character, right? That thou mayest be closed in the shame of thy nakedness, do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye set, which which I take as the first step, because that's, you know, where we then see our spiritual condition. That's the first step. We see ourselves as sinners. But in Revelation 3.18, it's in the reverse order. Okay. So any thoughts about Revelation 3.18 and why it's in reverse order? We can say it's a prophetic mirror, but is there something else? It's a mirror of Daniel 12.10. Do we have any symbolism in Revelation 3.18 as a number? Stephen or anyone? Bond. We have the 8.13 as in Daniel 8.13. Okay, so in reverse it's 8.13, which I didn't see. Okay, interesting. Stephen? All right, what are you saying? 318. What's the symbol in there? Oh, 318. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, well, we connected that to the, the number of days over from when you multiply the days uh, <clears throat> From 18, uh, from 31 AD to 1844. Right. Okay. So this was your study back in 2018. So you did this study yeah. and you found that if you, uh, count, if you multiplied, so you took the one of the days out of a prophetic year to see the amount of time that Christ was in the holy place. So you went from, uh, the day of Pentecost, when Christ begins his ministry, he anoints the heavenly sanctuary, begins his daily ministry. I can't remember the date. It's June something, 31 AD. And then you count the number of days to October 22nd, 1844, when he begins his work in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And uh, so you took one of those days out and you multiplied 359 times 1844, right? And you got 663,480, like if you did that math. But if you count the actual number of days, it uh, ended up being, and, and 
I think this is correct, 663,798, or am I doing something wrong? Let me see here. No, it's, I, I did that wrong. So it's 661,996 is 1844 times 359, right? So I did that wrong. Then we added, then if we look at the number of days, the actual number of days, that's right, 662,314. Does that sound right? So the difference is 318 days. Can you explain that, the significance of that difference of days? Stephen, because I can't hear you if you're not able to talk. Uh, sorry, what is it? Okay. Okay. Can you can you explain the 318? Right, okay. Um, as in just the days left over? You've explained that, haven't you? Sorry, I'm just going to come. I've just had a phone call. Someone was oh, speaking to me, so okay. I've kind of been uh, distracted. Okay. Okay, so we're counting from June 17th, 31 AD, which is Pentecost, and we count uh, 662,314 days, which is 318 days over the the math that you had done. Yeah, it has popped up in other things as well, but I can't really uh, remember where else we've seen it. Okay, but can you explain what you initially did with the 318 days? as a symbol? I can't remember. Okay, well you did that thing with the clock. With the, sorry, with the what? With the clock. Oh, right, okay. Um, well, that wasn't me, I think that was uh, Adelio who did that. No, it doesn't matter. I, I first heard it from you. Over the 1533, that was connected to it. it was the clock, 1533. So the 318 wasn't? I don't think so. Okay, what, what did we do with the 318 then? Yeah, I can't remember. It has, we, okay, so was you say 1533. Ah, okay. So I'm getting those two mixed up. Okay. Let me see if I can find this here. Okay. So uh, there was something that we did with the 318 days divided by 359. There was something that I did there. Yeah. So it was that I took the, well, so the way that I remember it, you know, there's 318 trained servants of Abraham in Genesis 1414. 14, okay. And, and what would we see in 1414? 14? The doubling. Yeah, but it's a doubling of the seven years for Leah and Rachel, 14, and the seven years of plenty and famine in the story of Joseph. Okay. So, so. The 318 days amounts to 21 hours, 15 minutes, and 33 seconds. So, so they're related, the 1533. The minutes and seconds remind us of the crucifixion of Christ in Mark 1533, and the ninth hour at which he died, right? Because 2100 hours is the ninth hour, right? Yes. Okay. Um, then we also get the 1533. 1533 BC and also from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844. So, so then we can, um, so if we divide, so the way that I did this is, um, uh, you know, I multiplied 1844 by 359 to get 661,996 days, which is 318 days short of reaching October 22nd, 1844. So that 318 days then is uh, where we take it as uh, 21 hours, 15 minutes, 33 seconds when we use years of 359 days. So, and then, right, and then we have, when we put it on a clock, uh, you know, an analog clock, uh, 21, 15, 33 seconds, Obviously, 15 after 9, you're going to have the hour and minute hand and a horizontal, right? And then you're going to have the second hand, not straight up and down, but just the bottom tilted to the left a bit. And so this would be looking at the cross from below the cross on the right-hand side, your right-hand side, Christ's left-hand side, looking up at the cross, right? So, so the 318... Now, we're saying that this is connected to 
Revelation 3.18. Does that seem reasonable that you can connect the three angels' messages of Revelation 3.18 to this period of time, the 1533, and to the crucifixion of Christ? And so Samuel's noting that uh, Stephen presented this in uh, Uganda, in Lyra. Okay, so we can take this 318 as as important, right? Okay, Dwight, do we want to look at what he says, what uh, Uri Smith says? Okay, now, <clears throat> while this may be a repeat, looking at the first message in the chat, today is the fourth anniversary of July 18th of 2020, 1,440 days ago. Acts 27, 28, 1,440 fathoms. Uh, Laban, Hebrew 38, 35, 3 by 8 by 3 by 5, equaling 360. <clears throat> we need to keep in mind where we are really within our history. I mean, there's there's so many things, so many different symbols that were coming from this. So... Okay, and it's it's pointed not 1,440 days, but 1,461 days. Yeah, so obviously four times 360 is 1,440. But, okay. but because there's, you know, 365 and a quarter days in a, in a Julian or Gregorian year, um, generally in the Gregorian, always in the Julian, in four years, because you got the uh, 365 times four plus the one leap year, one leap day. So 1,461 days is the actual number of days, anniversary since July 18, 2020. So 1,461 becomes a symbol of the Julian year, but, okay. you know, because that's the number of days in a, in a leap year cycle, right, every four years. Okay. <clears throat> Smith continues. Yeah, so just one thing. So the difference there is 21 days. Correct. Which which becomes an important symbol as well. Because right. in Daniel chapter 10, right, he's going to be fasting 21 days. And there there's actually quite a bit there that, that I don't think any of us have really completely understood. Yeah. Smith continues. Though restrained, the spirit of persecution was not destroyed. It broke out wherever there was opportunity, especially this was this the cause in England. The religious state of that kingdom was fluctuating. It sometimes under Protestant and sometimes under papal jurisdiction. According to the religion of the ruling house, the bloody Queen Mary was a mortal enemy to the Protestant cause and multitudes fell victims to her relentless persecutions. And this condition of affairs was to last more or less to the time of the end. The natural conclusion would be that when the time of the end should come, this power, which the Church of Rome had had to punish heretics, which had been the cause of so much persecution, and which had for a time been restrained, would now be taken entirely away. And the conclusion would be equally evident that this taking away of the papal supremacy would mark the commencement of the period here called the time of the end. If this application is correct, the time of the end commencement in 1798, for there, as already noticed, the papacy was overthrown by the French and has never since been able to wield the power it before possessed. <clears throat> Advent Review, Sabbath Herald, 7th of March, 1871, Uriah Smith, editor. So here we have Smith's application taking this to being up until 1798. <clears throat> yeah. Which, which I understand why he does that based on how he's looking at things. Sure. But, but I think it has to be 1798 to 1844 because the Moed can't refer to 1798. 
the time appointed. It has to refer to October 22nd, 1844. Okay. And, and, and that's the other thing is he's not taking into account the word yet. And, and also that word yet, since it's, since it's an iteration, is telling us that this history is going to be repeated as well. I forgot to mention that. Okay. So, so it's telling us that this history that's going to be mentioned here, Millerite history, is going to be repeated. It, it's built right into this verse and that the time at the end is then going to be repeated, which which we, we've shown other places that the time at the end is repeated, that there's two times at the end in Daniel chapter 11 that are being addressed. OK, so one way we could translate this is we could say, you know, some of them, the wise, some of the wise, right, that's the understanding, shall fall to try them, to purge them, to make them white. From the time of the end to the time appointed, which will be repeated, right? So, so that period is going to be repeated. And that's the word yet. But it's just, you know, we, we, you know that would be a more paraphrase. But really, the direct understanding is still fine. Okay. Okay. Any other comments or thoughts? Any questions? So, so that article is March 7th. So it says this article is dated 1,550 years after Constantine's Sunday Law. So, so it's dated as March 7th, 1871, this, this article. The article is dated, yes, 7th okay. of March. Yeah. yeah, so 1,550 years after Constantine's Sunday Law. Interesting point and an interesting catch. Okay, now, in going on to the next, next article on the 14th of March of 1871. Now, as I'm looking this over from the initial study using the 1769 Bible, the next verse that we're going to go into has before it the paragraph break. So it's, it's going into whether we would call this a different thought or another book another role the verse itself reads and the king shall do according to his will and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that that is determined shall be done now here again, this is one of those verses that Mrs. White did offer a an interesting point. Now, we would find these points in letter 103 of 1904, beginning in paragraph 15, reading what she had to say here for our consideration as we delve into what Smith has to say in a moment. My soul is in distress as I see souls perishing out of Christ. I long to see them coming into the truth. I see many places where means is greatly needed that a beginning may be made. The medical missionary work is the pioneer work of the gospel. Now, what does it mean to us for this to be a pioneer work? Isn't it that which is opening the doors? Okay, so which, which letter is this again? It was what? Letter 103 of 1904. Okay. The medical missionary work is the pioneer work of the gospel. Work for the sick and suffering tends to remove prejudice against the evangelical work. The hearts of those for whom medical missionary work is done are often by this mean opened to the truth. By this work, wealthy people may be reached, who with their means will assist in the work. This has been demonstrated in Australia. We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place 
and the fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. An arm shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame and by captivity, by spoil, many days. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, and yet, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. Scenes similar to these described in these words will take place. We see evidence that Satan is fast obtaining the control of human minds who have not the fear of God before them. Let all read and understand the prophecies of this book. For we are now entering upon the time of trouble spoken of. So in 1904, she was seeing that they were beginning to enter upon the time of trouble. And we keep looking for that as well. Do we not? Mm -hmm. Now, returning to what Smith has had to say. Well, we're just getting back to what Ellen White says here. Okay, go ahead. So um, now you read... From which verses um, in Daniel 11? Daniel 11, verses 30 to 36. Now, does she mention those verses? Because I'm looking on the E.G. White disc, and it doesn't doesn't have all, all of those verses being listed. In the copy, the, the one that is published currently on the E.G. White estate website, it lists it directly. Okay. Yeah, just here, this one on the E.G. White disc doesn't. Okay. Um, because here they have, uh, you know, they that understand among the people shall instruct many. They shall, that's where it starts, and it just goes up to, uh, so it's basically doing 34 and 35, I think, and 36. So it doesn't have verse 30 here. But it's important that we understand this history, then, if, if it's going to be... Um, you know, one is it hasn't reached its reached its complete fulfillment. So that means it's still in the process of being fulfilled. Right. And so the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. Oh, the, and then she says in the thirtieth verse, a power is spoken of. Okay, I see. Uh, so it's going to have some of this, but it leaves out some of the verses that you read. So I mean, it's pretty important that we understand this if we're going to understand its repeat. It's repetition. Right. I'm taking a look here just just quickly. Yeah, because I understood it's verse 30 to 36 that she she's quoting. But here it's just not all of the verses. Okay, now this letter was written to Hi- Hiram, middle initial A, Craw, okay. 24th of February of 1904. The letter was published in its entirety in 13 manuscript releases, pages 390 to 394. Okay. So it's interesting. This is a letter that Mrs. White sends to this brother Craw and asks if he would lend her one to $2,000 at a low rate of interest because this has to do with publication of some of her books. So... Yeah, because this is quoting directly verses 30 to 36 in the actual letter. Okay. 
Now, she then pairs this with Daniel 12, 1 to 4. So when she, she gives the statement that seems similar to those described in these words will take place, we see evidence that Satan is fast obtaining the control of human minds who have not the fear of God before them. Let all read and understand the prophecies of this book, for we are now entering upon this, the time of trouble that is spoken of. So she's quoting Daniel 11, verse 31 to 36. Correct. And... and Connects it to 12, verse 4. 12, 1 through 4. 1 through 4, okay. So she then connects that. At the time shall Michael stand up, the great prince that standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was, since there was a nation, even to that same time, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, stand, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Give me just a moment. There's a paragraph right at the end of this. Okay. The Spirit of the Lord is being withdrawn from the world. It is no time now for men to exalt themselves. It is no time for the people of God to be erecting costly buildings or to be using the Lord's entrusted talent of means in glorifying themselves. Whatever we do, we shall do economically. The buildings we erect should be plain without useless display. Let us beware of selfish greed. And that concludes the 22nd paragraph. And that concludes the letter as well. So kind of interesting to see what, what she's had to say there. Now, Smith continues. The king here introduced cannot denote the same power which was last noticed, namely the papal power. For the specifications will not hold good if applied to that power. Take a declaration of the next verse, nor regard any God. This has never been true of the papacy. God and Christ, though often placed in a false position, have never been set aside and rejected from that state, that system of religion. The only difficulty in applying it to a new power lies in the definite article, the, for it is urged, the expression, the king, would identify this as the last one spoken of. If it could be properly translated a king, there would be no difficulty, for it is said that some of the best biblical critics give it this rendering. Mead, Wentzel, Boothroyd, and others translating the passage, a certain king shall do according to his will, thus clearly introducing a new power upon the stage of action. Yeah, now, okay. So obviously you can't translate it that way because because it it isn't that way. Well, here again, here is Smith making the application that the mind of other men are superior to those that had been led of God in the translation that put together the King James Bible. Yeah, plus it just plainly says in Hebrew, the king. Okay. It's Ha Melech. So it's not a king. It's not introducing a new king. Well, isn't it also introduced? It, it's interesting to me that when we look at the early portions, Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, all the way through here, we are looking at these progressive powers. And Smith now wishes to introduce a power that was not introduced in these other chapters. Right, and that, which is James White's argument. Right. We, all, we always go to the papacy. Why would we go to some other power here now? Right. Plus, he's taking nor regard any God as atheism. Agreed. Right? But... Yeah. <laughs> Why, why would you interpret that as atheism? Brother, you're not coming through very clear. 
uh, because uh, when we look at in, in what happened in France, oh, I'm saying uh, like what happened was the time that uh, they uh, had to get rid of the Bible and they said uh, there is no God. And uh, in Revelation chapter 11, that's where France comes in. Yeah, France is atheistic, but there's nothing in this verse that says this is an atheistic power. It just says that he's not going to regard any God, right? So so he's it's because he is the God, right? He may, shall magnify himself above every God and speak marvelous things against the God of gods. Now, all we would have to do is just compare this with other statements in in the bible regarding the papacy right you know in daniel 7 he shall speak great words against the most high he shall wear out the saints of the most high he shall think to change times and laws right so that's describing the same power well in in this situation as as you're well pointing out right now yeah if we're comparing this scripture with scripture mm -hmm. The portion shall do according to his own will. We would then have to look back at Daniel eleven sixteen. But he that cometh against him shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which by his hand shall be consumed. But then when he shall exalt himself, if we are then looking at Daniel 7, verse 8, along mm -hmm. with 725 and 825, and then a couple of passages from the New Testament, we get a very different picture. Because... Right. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. I mean, Daniel 7, verse 8, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them a little horn, another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horn plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Now, can this be anyone else but the papacy? No. I mean, even Smith had agreed with that. Yeah. And, and he agrees that it's the papacy all the way up to verse 35, right? Or, you know, so that finally we have, in his view, it's introducing a new power, which, which doesn't follow especially since we can just directly compare this to second Thessalonians chapter two, which, which Smith will, you know, accept is the papacy. Well, that right? one, right. You know, so it says who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he is God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. I mean, that's really a direct reference to Daniel 11 verse 36. Paul's quoting that. When we take this along with Daniel 8.25, and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without him. Who else has... That's talking about pagan Rome, but pay, papal Rome is pagan Rome. Like they're both Rome. Right. Yes. Agreed. Right. So to have this to be France, that's going to be introduced, the king of France, it, it doesn't really make sense. And and it's just he's he's depending so much on he does not regard any God as as, as claiming that this is representing atheism. But it's true that the papacy really doesn't regard any God. Right. Right. Because he's magnifying himself above every God. Correct. It mean, so it just has to do with, with who he's honoring, because the idea of regard is not like a belief in or a rejection of, you know, that God exists. So I'm not quite sure how how he he takes that. Now, there what's are the meaning of what's the meaning of regard? Yeah, I was just going to explain that. Oh, here. sorry. So um, so it, it's it's three different words. So we got uh, the word. Uh, kol, which means whole, all or every, right? So that's how you're getting uh, uh, any, nor regard any. You have 3808, that's the word low, that means nor or not, it's a negation, right? And then you have 995, 
Ben Bien, or how do you say that? Ben Benny, not sure how you say that one. I'm not sure about those vowel pointings, but um, it seems to separate mentally or distinguish. That, that is generally understand, attend, consider, cunning, diligently, direct, discern, uh, feel, inform, instruct, have intelligence, know, look well to, mark, perceive, be prudent, regard, teach, think, understand. So, so this is not a rejection of God at all, like any God, right? That, that's not like God doesn't exist. It's that he doesn't consider God, right? He doesn't give honor to God, any God. For he shall magnify himself above all, right? So this, is, this isn't atheism. This is just, you know, pride, self-exaltation and usurpation. Now, especially when we are comparing this, Daniel 11.36 with Revelation 13, verses 5 and 6. Okay. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Now... Mm -hmm. In, in this situation, we do not see Smith's consideration being given a period of 42 months or 1,260 days. So comparing scripture with scripture, doesn't it become very obvious that we're not able to introduce another power? Now, now in, in, and in, in verse 38, right? It right. says, but in his estate, um, that is on his base or pedestal or office, shall he honor the God of forces or fortresses? A right. God whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold, silver, with precious stones and pleasant things? Now, I'm not sure. I mean, it, to say he doesn't regard any God, that that is true, but he does have a God that he does honor, right? So now it says a, a God whom his fathers knew not, right? So we took this as the fathers referring to paganism, right? Because the papacy is the descendant of paganism. That, that's how we understood this, that, that his fathers knew not, the God that his fathers knew not, is the Christian God, so to speak, right? This this new God. And, and part of it is that you could say when he doesn't regard any God, that is, he's not acknowledging directly the pagan gods, but he is acknowledging a so-called Christian God, which was really just a pagan God. Right. Right. So this is a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. This only makes sense of the papacy. It doesn't make sense of France. But yeah. and I always wonder, well, how did how did um, Uriah, Uriah Smith come up with this view? Well, you know, it wasn't it wasn't his view initially, right? That is, other people had this view, but but this definitely went contrary to everything that. Um, Ellen and James White were teaching. Well, it, it goes contrary to everything that Miller had taught as a very foundational point. Yes. So so he, he didn't get this from the Millerites. No. He got this. He got this from Protestant commentaries. Yes. Now it is true that the Millerites did have an improper understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40, right? But And, and we did look at this before, so I'm just trying to find it here. But uh, so it, it it's kind of a mixture of different ideas. In, in a sense, the way that Uriah, Uriah, Uriah Smith presents it is something kind of unique to him, right? It's not, it's not 
really just like he gets the idea from other people, but he builds it into his own idea. Um, I'm going to try to find this. Okay, I'm just trying to see what Miller says about this. Yeah, so Miller applies this to the papacy, right? He says, in this passage, we have a plain description of the papacy. They do not worship the same gods the pagans did, their fathers, right? And their clergy are forbidden to marry. The Pope calls himself the vice uh, gerent of God and or God on earth, right? Yeah, so, so Miller doesn't have this view. So Smith is not promoting Miller's view. And that's part of that's one of the problems that, um, you know, these people that, you know, they want to have Uriah Smith, you know, be inspired. Right. Um, they also want Miller to be inspired. Um, and they just kind of ignore that Miller doesn't take this position. Now, it is true that Josiah Litch does have this position regarding this verse. Okay. Right. So. So. So Josiah Litch also has this view, but he gets it from um, Alexander Keith, which he got a lot of his stuff from. Okay, so we're going to see yeah, Josiah Litch. So Miller and Litch are in disagreement on that. But, you know, they didn't disfellowship each other. Right. They still communicated. Yeah, and worked t- together. Exactly. That's because they were in the Philadelphia church. But as far as that, nor regard any God, the only people that I can find commenting on it are basically Miller, Josiah Litch, and Uriah Smith. So, so far I can't find anybody else quoting that phrase in the Pioneer's writings. Okay, but but I guess that was part of the what, what people in Africa have been struggling with. Uh, with Uriah Smith's interpretation of this verse. Now, of course, if you take this verse as being France, and you take the king of the north as being Turkey and the king of the south as Egypt, that you ignore the fact that we've moved from literal to spiritual regarding the north and the south, uh, then there would be no reason to be in this movement. It would be totally incongruous to believe like Uriah Smith does and to believe this movement. Okay, Dwight. Okay. Now, Smith's next points. Three particulars must be shown in the power which fulfills this prophecy. It must assume the character here delineated near the commencement of the time of the end, to which we are brought down in the preceding verse. It must be a willful power. It must be an atheistical power. Or perhaps the two latter might be united by saying that its willfulness would be manifested in the direction of atheism. Now, we have all these powers doing according to their own will. Right. We, we see that with Babylon does according to its own will. Medo-Persia does according to its own will. Greece does according to its own will. Pagan Rome does according to its own will. And, and we believe the papacy does according to its own will. And that these these are the powers that are in this line of the kingdoms. France is not one of the kingdoms. Now, you could argue, you know, France is a part of Rome, right? In, in a sense, it's a division of, of the kingdom. But it doesn't stand on its own as one of the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't occur in the other lines. Now, we can say, well, France occurs in the context of Revelation chapter 11. Well, it's true. France has that part to play at the end, but it's going to be connected with with spiritualism, which isn't really introduced in Daniel. Okay. Okay, so what else is he doing? Smith continues. A revolution exactly answering to this description did take place in France at the time indicated in the prophecy. Voltaire had sowed the seeds which bore their legitimate and baleful fruit. That godless infidel in his impious but impotent self-conceit had said, I am weary of hearing of 
people repeat that 12 men established the Christian religion. I will prove that one man may suffice to overthrow it. Associating with himself such men as Rousseau, D'Alembert, Diderville, and others, he took, undertook the work. They sowed to the wind and reaped the whirlwind. Their efforts culminated or culminated in the revolution of 1793 when the Bible was discarded and the existence of the deity denied as the voice of the nation. The historian thus describes this great religious chain. It was not enough, they said, for a regenerate nation to have dethroned earthly kings unless she stretched out the arm of defiance toward those powers which superstition had represented as reigning over boundless space. Scott's Napoleon, Volume 1, page 172. Now, of course, this brings up uh, another important point, which we have mentioned other times. But when it comes to this history um, in Revelation 11, verse 8, it -hmm. says, And their bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where our Lord also was crucified. Now, so he's referring to this history, which we, we do acknowledge is Revelation chapter 11. Right. But we can see that France is related to Egypt, correct? Definitely. And, and, and Egypt is the king of the south, literally, right? Correct. And, and then he's going to have uh, France not be Egypt if Egypt is the king of the south. One of the Because first the king of the south is going to come against France, according to Uriah Smith. Right. In verse 40. And then uh, Turkey is going to come against France. But he now has Egypt coming against Egypt. If he's going to be consistent. Right. Which which is inconsistent. So so he he wants France to be Egypt in Revelation 11, verse eight. But he doesn't want France to be Egypt. In. In Daniel 11, verse uh, 40, right? That's the way it looks. So one is he next needs to recognize that that this is to be understood spiritually, not literally. But he's mixing these two. And this was the problem that Jeff had initially with presentations that he had seen on Daniel chapter 11, moving into Daniel chapter 12, is that people were mixing literal and spiritual. That they didn't know how to to know that before the cross literal, after the cross spiritual. And so the king of the north can't be literally the king of the north. Egypt can't literally be Egypt. Babylon can't literally be Babylon. They have to be symbols. The king of the south has to be a symbol. And so the king of the south is Egypt and symbolizes spiritual Egypt, which symbolizes France. So I guess you guys will have to come back to this on Sunday. So I won't be here when time's up. Okay. Any other comments, thoughts, or questions at this point? Well, just, just one comment, just dealing with, you know, I, I don't know particularly what's what's happened in Africa and, and why, you know, people are taking the position they are and how many are trying to promote Uriah Smith's view. Um, and, you know, so I don't know much about, about it, but... You know, hopefully people take the time to look at this and and to recognize that if you're going to be in this movement, for one, you have to accept that verse 36 refers to the papacy. You you can't, they're not compatible, uh, Uriah Smith's view and the existence of this movement. But also just from the scriptures, it's pretty plain it has to be the papacy. Right. You know. But for those who think they can have their cake and eat it too, you know, you you can't. You can attack, if you believe it's, you know, France, well, then you should be opposed to this movement completely and not be a part of it. Because that's what this movement is founded on, Daniel 11, verse 40. Okay. The last last thought I'll, I'll leave on this part. Given when this article was published, 
And when all of this that Smith had been presenting had been given at Battle Creek Church, let's remember that neither James nor Ellen White chose to seek the disfellowshipment or the casting out of Uriah Smith. They allowed a full presentation of his ideas, even if they did not agree with his ideas. Yeah. Now there is there is this sort of debate. Sorry, I know that was supposed to be the last thing, but um, over the idea that Ellen White supported Uriah Smith in some of his presentations regarding the sick man of the East, but it doesn't mean that she agreed with everything that he said. Right. And we don't really particularly know everything that he said and what she was really referring to. Um, but the people try to equate that with uh, Uriah Smith's interpretation of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, that Ellen White agreed with that interpretation. But none of those predictions of Smith's panned out. Some people try to fit it into the First World War. But, uh, okay. Anyway. All right. So shall we now close this session with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, thank you for this time that we were able to spend together Considering your words of scripture, considering that which Mrs. White had presented, and considering these of Uriah Smith, help us now as we go through this day. May your will be done. We need you, Father, in all ways. Guide us, direct us, we ask, for we seek your blessing as we look to represent your character in all that we do. Help us now, Father so that your will is done in our lives in all ways. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.